Uh, thank you to all of you for some great questions. Here's what I tried to do for this first episode. Uh, I would say that over half of all the questions had to do with three basic topics. And those were the curriculum framework, uh, which is sort of replaces the old ACORN booklet, uh, resources for teachers, especially new teachers, and what are some of the common topics on the free response portion of the exam, and how are these questions graded? So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to address those three topics. That'll take us at least an hour. And then I make it into, I'll try to get into some of the specific questions next time. So here we go. I'm going to start off talking about the AP Calculus Curriculum Framework. And I will talk specifically about changes to the AP Calculus Curriculum. I'm going to talk about what they are now calling uh, mathematical practices, the big ideas in the course, and these three items called Enduring Understandings, Learning Objectives, and Essential Knowledge Statements. So remember, this curriculum framework is sort of a refresh. Uh, AP Calculus hasn't changed that much at all. You'll see that in a minute. And this replaces that sort of old <coughs> ACORN booklet, which listed all of the topics item by item. Now, I'll show you where you can download a copy of this, but this is a cover of the framework. And I'm showing you this because the picture on the cover is actually quite mathematical. That's a picture of the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts, which is in Kansas City, which is right next door to the convention center where we grade the AP calculus exams. We've actually watched this center being built for the last six years. And not only is it on there because it's right next door, but it also has a lot of mathematics in here. If you look at that, that looks like slices from a solid created by rotating a region about an axis. So those are slices of a solid, a real-world application. How do you like that? Of the volume of a solid of revolution. That's pretty cool. All right, here we go. Key changes to our course. Well, this is a course refresh. That replaces the old topic outline, and don't panic. Now, those of you who have been teaching AP Calculus for a number of years, keep doing the same thing. You're doing a great job. There's just a couple little things that you have to incorporate into your class. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is kind of give you a hierarchy of the way this curriculum framework is structured, at least in my mind. There are six mathematical practices, and I will uh, list all of those in a minute or two. There are four big ideas, uh, limits, derivatives, integrals on the fundamental theorem of calculus, and series. And underneath those big ideas, there are enduring understandings, learning objectives, and essential knowledge statements. And I'll try to show you how all of this fits in, fits together, with a couple of screenshots from the pages of this curriculum framework. Now look, there are no topics removed from the current AP Calculus syllabus, from the current course. So again, whatever you're doing, you're doing a great job. However, there are a couple of topics that have been added. In Calculus AB, there's only one topic that's been added, and that's L'Hopital rule, specifically the indeterminate forms of 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity. Now the truth is that most of you have probably been teaching these topics anyway, now this is more formalized, and you'll, you will certainly see some questions about this topic on the 2017 exam, I would expect. In Calculus BC, there are three additional topics. One of them is the limit comparison test, which many of you probably already teach anyway. Absolute and conditional convergence. We've actually tested that previously on the AP exam. We just don't call. We haven't called it that before. And the alternating series error bound. And the truth is we've actually tested that also without actually calling it by that name. So again, nothing really dramatic here, nothing really that new, but you do have to prepare for specific questions on those topics. The exam format is going to remain exactly the same. There will be a multiple choice and a free response section, each counting 50% of the total grade. There is one slight change in the multiple choice section of the exam. I'm not sure if you can see this on your screen, but I have the 30 and the 15 bold face. There's a small change in the number of questions in each part. 
There will now be 30 questions in Part A where a calculator is not permitted, and only 15 in Part B where the calculator is allowed. And I just want to remind you, in those graphing calculator active questions, that means you may, the student may need to use a graphing calculator, but may not need one. In the pre-response portion of the exam, there is no change at all. There will still be six questions. As far as I can tell uh, from the A, B, and the B, C, there will still be three common ones. Two of them will be graphing calculator active. You'll put your student will put the calculator away, and the remaining four the calculator will not be permitted in still 90 minutes. I put this in here because I wanted to emphasize two important phrases. This is the general philosophy of the course as stated in the curriculum framework. And the first thing I wanted to point out and remind you about is that we want students to master necessary procedures and skills. We hear a lot about this from my college colleagues. We still want students to be able to come into our math classes after taking AP count. And we still want them to know process. And we still want them to be able to take a derivative by hand. We still want them to do an indefinite interval by hand. So that's still important. And in addition to that, ever since calculus reform, we still want students to develop mathematical knowledge conceptually. We want students to understand concepts. So here are the six mathematical practices for AP calculus as listed in the curriculum framework. And I just want to talk very briefly about these. The first one is reasoning with definitions and theorems. So previously, a criticism of calculus classes has been the students just memorize definitions and theorems, and they don't really know how to connect it or they can't really use them. So we want students now to be able to use them for sure. We want students to be able to connect concepts. Another complaint we've often heard is, that, well, mathematics calculus is just a collection of disconnected concepts. Well, that's not true. Uh, we want them to be able to connect concepts. If you've looked at previous free response questions, you know that we try to ask questions that bring together a lot of ideas, and we ask students to connect those ideas and answering those questions. The third one is implementing algebraic and computational processes. I think this is just a fancy way of saying, look, we want them to have procedural skills. We want them, again, to be able to take a limit, do a derivative, take an indefinite interval. We want them to connect multiple representations. And we've heard about this rule of four or even five for many years now. We want them to be able to talk about functions and situations numerically, analytically, verbally, graphically. Five is one of my favorites. For any of you who attended the TQ conference a couple of weeks ago, I gave a talk on building notational fluency. I have to tell you that I'm very glad that this is in here as a mathematical practice. Mathematics has such an elegant language, and we want students to be able to write mathematics with appropriate notation. We want them to be able to convey their answers, convey their reasoning and logic by using proper notation. And finally, down there in six, we want students to be able to communicate in writing. We want them to be able to explain an answer to us succinctly using correct mathematical terms and expressions. And down at the very bottom of this, I want to remind you that we still want students to be able to use graphing calculators and other technologies also. That's not going away. Uh, the four rules or the four, pardon me, functions that you can use your calculator, that a student can use the calculator for, that's not changing. So we still want students to be able to use that technology when they take the exam. So here's just a brief overview of these big ideas. The first one is limits. We want students to be able to compute various limits, one-sided limits, limits in infinity, the limit of a sequence, and infinite limits. We certainly want students to be able to use tables and graphs to estimate a limit. This is often the very first section in a calculus book to give students an idea of what a limit is all about. We work from tables and graphs to get this idea of a function approaching a specific value. We want students to know and work with algebraic properties of limits. We want them to know techniques for finding limits of indeterminate forms, and that's, of course, a reference to L'Hopital's rule. 
And we want them to be able to use limits, especially one-sided limits, to determine continuity. And I think you'll see a specific example of this one later on this evening. The second big idea is derivatives. We want students to be able to describe rate of change in a variety of contexts. Uh, the most recent free response questions have had some, I think, very interesting contextual problems. And we want students to be able to describe, say, a derivative in the context of a problem. We want them to be able to use limits to define a derivative, recognize a limit as the derivative of a function, certainly various applications. We want them still to be able to analyze a function using derivatives. You know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, this was probably the main sort of a question on the AP calculus. Here's a function. Tell me where it's increasing, decreasing, concave up, down. Where are the extreme values? So we still want students to be able to do that. We want them to be able to use tables and graphs to estimate derivatives. Frequently, this is one of the very first questions on the free response portion of the exam. Given a table, use that table to estimate a derivative. Use rules and properties, of course. For example, uh, the product rule, the quotient rule, the chain rule. We still need students to be able to solve separable differential equations, to even just verify a solution. And certainly, we've asked questions previously, and we'll continue to on the mean value theorem, related rates optimization, and growth and decay models. The third big idea has to do with integrals, and the most important idea in calculus, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Certainly, we want students to know the definition of the definite integral. We want them to know approximation methods for a definite integral, say left, right, midpoint sums, the trapezoidal sum. We want them to be able to use geometry to say, not estimate, but maybe find an exact value of a definite integral. They need to know basic techniques of integration, substitution, properties of integrals. They should know many interpretations of a definite integral. For example, we usually test area volume, motion applications. They should certainly know that the definite integral can be used as an accumulation function. And finally, down at the bottom, they need to know, of course, the fundamental theorem of calculus. They need to be able to work with this, analyze functions defined by an integral. There have been loads of questions the past few years where a function has been defined by a definite integral, and we've asked students many questions about that new function. The fourth big idea, for those of you teaching BC calculus, this has to do with series, of course. Students need to know about series of numbers and power series. They need to be able to determine convergence and divergence or divergence of a series. They should know the McLaren series for common functions. Uh, one of the questions previously uh, started out, one question I think BC6 started out by just asking the student to write the McLaren series or write the first four terms of the McLaren series for e to the x. So they need to know those common McLaren series. They should know the general Taylor series representations. They should be able to find the radius and interval of convergence and know about operations on power series. And we need to be able to use power series to approximate an arbitrary function near a specific value. I didn't write this in here, but certainly we've asked questions and will continue to ask questions about bounding the error in using a Taylor series or using an approximation. OK, fantastic. Thanks for bearing with me. This is a screenshot of a page out of the curriculum framework. And this will just give you a little, line, little bit of an idea how these three items, enduring understandings, learning objectives, and essential knowledge, knowledge items all fit together. So on the left-hand side, you see EU 2.1. Under that enduring understanding, there is a learning objective. And under that learning objective, there are several essential knowledge statements. So you're not going to see a topic outline uh, like you did in the ACON booklet. This is what the CF is going to look like. All of the questions, all of the multiple choice questions on the exam, all of the free response questions on the exam will be keyed to these EUs, LOs, and EKs. This is an example of a multiple choice question that could appear in 2017. You'll notice one thing here. The number of choices is reduced from 5 to 4. 
There'll still be rights-only scoring, but now students will only have to choose from four possible answers. Makes it a little bit easier for us as we write these questions. It's kind of hard to write good what we call distractors. But people have been asking, well, why did uh, the College Board and ETS change from five to four? And I'm not sure if I have a good answer to that. Uh, I believe that uh, this is the way that some of the other national exams are presenting multiple choice questions. And I think that the CB just wanted to be in line with those. Remember once again that uh, there's rights only scoring. So even if a student can't narrow it down to one or two cho or to a couple of choices, they should take a guess. And down at the bottom of this page, you'll see how the LOs, EKs, and mathematical practices are linked to the multiple choice question. And here's a, a screenshot of a free response question that's in the curriculum framework. These are going to look very, very similar. I, I don't foresee many changes, if any, in 2017, except it will certainly test some of the new material, the new topics. If you take a look at Part C in this question, that happens to be a L'Hopital's rule question. And if you take a look at Part D, you'll notice that that's a question about a function defined in terms of another one. That's a very common idea, common theme. So how do you get the curriculum framework? You can download a copy of this document from that website. Uh, and I have a screenshot there of just the top of that page and what it looks like. And on the right-hand side, there's a link to download that curriculum framework in PDF format. I'll just give you one word of warning here. I noticed that when I downloaded it, I wanted to be able to manipulate it. And probably some of you are better at this than I am. But I have a pretty fancy version of Adobe Acrobat. And that PDF file is pretty well protected and locked. It was very difficult for me to manipulate it and to work with it. You can take screenshots of it, that's for sure. Uh, but it's, it's kind of difficult to work with, but you can at least download it. 